Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, now we're recording. So yeah, my name is, like I said, my name is Kevin. Uh, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself and I guess your business, Saltability? Sure. Uh, my name's Ann Brown. Uh, I started Saltability in 20, the end of 2014. Uh, it came out of, I've been in the spa industry for about 25 years, uh, mostly opening and designing resort spas for a living. And uh, I wanted to solve a problem of how to make the hot stone uh, massage a little bit uh, cleaner, less chemicals, no water, kind of clean it up. We're in a eco-friendly business and we weren't really walking our talk. So I patented and designed a way to heat up hand-carved Himalayan salt stones without the use of water with a 15th a less electricity and no chemicals. Oh, nice. And then so, so for something like that, like how long did it take you to, you know, come up with a design or the patent and then sort of get everything in production? Uh, it took about six months oh, wow. and I, I think my best quality and my worst quality is impatience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, when I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. So I just didn't waste any time. I had two engineers that were very entrepreneurial and they helped me design it and I paid for five prototypes and every time I would just spend all my time working on the one prototype they sent to see if it was good, it could be better, how efficient it was. And I did my due diligence. I see a lot of people that kind of wait and say, oh, I'm going to get around to that. And yeah, like I said, it's a good and a bad quality. Yeah. yeah. For something, for something like that, did you have, did you like save up previous money for that? I know you were saying you had previous business, so you were able to use some of your funds from your other company for this new, I guess, prototypes. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. I'm just going to speak honestly. I was, at a very large resort spa, one of the largest in the Midwest, and I was paid well, and I was bored. Yep. And what I hear a lot of people say that aren't, aren't entrepreneurs is, or even entrepreneurs, after a little bit of time, they get bored. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really effectively bored, and I thought, so I just started using some of my own money because I really didn't want to go out and make it formal, maybe just through the risk of failure. Mm -hmm. So I just put aside some of my own money and kept piecemealing it and finding ways to keep growing the company I had in my head and working my day job too. Yeah, no, that's exactly, I mean, I know exactly how you feel because when I was at my other company in San Francisco, I had the same feeling. I was there for about two years and, you know, I just get bored and you're just like, you have this itch that you want to do something and it's like, you can't stop thinking about it. And yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I had. I was living in San Francisco four years ago and then I left to you know essentially come to New York because I just couldn't do it I, I don't know it's like a feeling that you have and because entrepreneurs have that feeling I guess and it is it's an itch it's an irritation it's also a vulnerability and yeah. you know I have to say there's been some really good things that have come out of it and some things that I want to work on that you know I you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you tend to work your day job and your evening job and in your sleep, you tend to think this is my worth now. And I was really good at spending other people's money. I've always been a very goal oriented mm -hmm. gal and profit um, with profitability. And in, I'm in the hospitality industry. So customer service excellence. I am a world spa judge. So making sure that I hit all the marks and almost a level of perfection is yeah. a double-edged sword too. So, you know, I think as an entrepreneur now for four years, what I miss is sometimes growing with a group of people. I tend to do a lot of charity work now mm -hmm. when I'm not working because I love the mental human capital of some of those people. They've reached pinnacles in their mm -hmm. lives where they're super bright and they want to give back. And I'm just, people say, gosh, why do you do all this charity work? And really it's because as an entrepreneur, I'm working with two or three or four people that I like, but in past uh, mm -hmm. resort industries, I'd be working with a full executive team and 20 or 30 people. Or if I was consulting, I'd be consulting with a, one of the leading day spa chains in the U S. And so then you're kind of around just the smartest 2% in their company. And that used, to, and it drives me wild in a way of getting me going. So, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to everything. I think you have to kind of make uh, yeah. lemonade out of lemons. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like working, I was working at a big company too. I was working at Intuit and that's massive company and a lot of big people and a lot of smart people. And then with your own company, it's much smaller. And sometimes you do miss that. You're like, oh, I just miss a camaraderie, like really smart people working together. And just that whole sort of feeling um, was, you don't have yet because you're still growing your company. Well, and I think it's based, I I, uh, am very close friends with people that I've met here in Boca Raton through uh, a lot of charity and they're very affluent and he's a very big uh, immigration attorney. But he said to me, I, I only want to work by myself Mm. and I don't, but I wouldn't have known that being an entrepreneur because all I was doing was fixing a problem. I was going to grow this business, but I didn't really realize I would spend a lot of my time asking myself, is this the best decision instead of people and mentors and um, colleagues on the same level as me? So there are personalities that love that kind of, uh, you know, uh, one horse rodeo kind of thing. And from all my personality tests, I'm a little more altruistic where I would like to build people up and grow people into new jobs and different perspectives. So I guess I'm doing that through charity now. Oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, Same thing. I'm similar to that, too, where I kind of want to work with team members and I just don't want to be with myself. That's sort of kind of what I'm doing this, you know, connecting with entrepreneurs just because I just, uh, being alone is not for me. And I like it sometimes because you get work done, but I also like that team building, building people up, teaching them things that they might have not known, and also just talking about ideas and processes or the issues that you're going through because, you know, you're working together and you're seeing it and then you're getting better. You don't really know what you don't know. I just joined an entrepreneur group and, and the fellow's a, uh, a trust attorney and he wanted to grow his, he wanted to just, I think he wanted to get out of the attorney reference and grow with other people. So it's myself and three men. Mm-hmm. One is a certified financial planner. One owns a bunch of CrossFits, not a bunch, but a few. Mm-hmm. And one is this attorney. And one thing I've learned from them that I wouldn't have known is me and their efficiency levels are crazy high. Like I don't eat long. Like it's, it's a, it's a negative. Like if they, they have such efficiency levels all day. And yeah. I thought maybe the man versus a woman thing. I mean, I think that women are pretty efficient, but I would have never known that they use all these uh, even templates for efficiency levels. And they're constantly reading books on being efficient and every minute counts. And I think, you know, it's, but who would have known that efficiency levels, you mean, you know that you're in a, even working with Intuit, it's, it's about efficiency. It's about casting this large net of, accounting software and having everything for everyone but um yeah no being yeah even even for us here we always kind of say for we're we try to read efficiency books and how to get better even optimize like one hour like like with, even for something like this this call is i have everything kind of automated and set up that way it's like okay i know where i'm going to go on i know what i need to do and sort of that way i've planned out my day because you know some weeks like but this the, in the- opposite spectrum I'm in the spa industry you know every morning I do a meditation by myself for about 35 full minutes and I idolize that time every day I wouldn't miss it it's but it's I want to shut off my phone Mm -hmm. not be more efficient on it so because I think that grinds me more than anything if I can leave my phone alone and go to the beach I, I live on the ocean so but I thought Yesterday, when I was on the ocean, I said, boy, it's been a week since I've actually been to the beach. Like, you know, trying to find that space between on duty and kind of how do I reward myself? How do I be kind to myself? You know, I'm also doing a a mirroring workshop where you literally say to yourself, I love you, Anne, in a mirror. Mm. And I know that sounds silly, but Honestly, if, you know, we tend to have this little negative chatterbox going on about what we could do better because as an entrepreneur, you are kind of your, your best supporter and your worst critic. Yep. And if the worst critic takes over, you know, you, you tend to, especially I think a lot of entrepreneurs are perfectionistic. And I think some of that reduces with age and children and, and life in general, you know, um, but 
for me, I'm learning to kind of plug out more than plug in. Yeah, no, that don't make sense. Because even for me, like, even yesterday, I just couldn't stop thinking about something for work. And like, it was just like, I was at a show and I was just like thinking to myself, okay, like, if I just do this when I get home, I'll be totally fine. I can sleep at night. But it's like you say, it's like, you're just constantly thinking about it. And it's like, I'm like, okay, everything's going fine. I just don't need to do this. I just need to relax and I'll be fine. And like, but when I went home, I, I did it anyways, just because it was just and, and I'm sure your phone's never off. Uh, um, you know, like thick, thick non Han. I mean, he's big on breathing in, I'm breathing in, breathing out, I'm breathing out. So I've started a yoga program every evening, really because like you, and I don't know, I won't speak for you, but I'll speak for myself. I like to pop in and out. I just came from kickboxing. Mm. So I get in here really early. I work, I go to kickboxing, I come back out. I then go run an errand. I come and work really hard for three hours. Around four, I'm kind of tapped out. Mm -hmm. I've had enough. So, but what I would do is go home and I think, wow, what are the fun people doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what are they going to do till 930? So I'd go do some laps. And so now I do a 75 minute hot yoga program and it gets me into the evening hours. Uh, you know, I listen to a lot of Wayne Dyer and his thing is, you know, when you're filled with all this energy and chatter whether good or bad in your mind you stay busy but when your mind stops starts to rest sometimes it can be a very uh alone almost lonely type of feeling because you're so not used to plugging out mm -hmm. so for me it's just a great transition that 4 30 to 5 45 to allow me to reconnect with my body and head and mind and heart and then go into the evening hours with a sense of what's coming next. What am I going to do now for myself to kind of be kind, to reward myself, mm -hmm. to start to calm down? Yeah. Okay. That's good. So you do this every day? Like it's your weekly, daily ritual? Nice. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> well, I need it. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what you're doing, but you can't just stay all balled up. Now, you can when you're as young as you are, but for me, it's not – you know, it's not that healthy. I'm recently divorced. So that's yeah. a new layer of it too. And, um, you know, back to the company though, I think I started a second company about one year ago that does mm. similar things, but I needed a, a partner and, uh, we're building salt walls, um, mm. kind of those Himalayan block salt walls. And uh, I needed an engineer to help. So I asked this guy, I said, hey, let's get an operating agreement. I'd known him for 10 or 12 years. Yeah. And there could be no shortages of me starting companies. Yeah. But you have to do the, not just step one through five, you have to do five through 95. Yeah, which is like, uh, yeah, everything after. I, I know exactly what you mean. Like I have so many ideas, but like the one through five is always the exciting part. And then it's like the rest, which is like, oh my God, it's like the actual work. And yeah. Stuff. And some of us that are entrepreneurial, we don't like the day-to-day -day operations. You know, it doesn't drive me wild to do the mundane of some box that got cracked in UPS shipping over the Christmas holidays. It was going to Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's stuff. Yeah. That's why I like for me, exactly. You want to either hire a team member or sort of like for us, at least we sort of try to make it. So if we don't want to do that, who do we bring on board that is good at that and loves doing that role? That way that, that, that position or sort of that division can excel much better than let's say I would ever do it because I'm not that passionate about it. Yeah. And I think it's about delegating and, but you have to be big enough to where you can add yeah. staff and you can delegate. Otherwise, you know, it drives me crazy to see people sitting around not having a whole lot to do. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So yeah, I mean, I guess like uh, going back on like, you know, once you finish your prototype and, you know, manufacture the product, what was the process of, like, I guess, launching the product or your online store? Um, I, we have one very large uh, spa show. It's the International Spa Association Conference. It's every year. It's usually in Vegas. And I really, by the time June of 14 had rolled around, I was, the concept was live in my mind. I had just paid the money for the prototype. And I thought, okay, I'm going to spend eight thousand dollars on this conference in october and i'm going to debut the line so i went and got a videographer and he did this five minute video that's on my home site mm -hmm. that talks about the mission and vision of the company i knew a lot of therapists because i was running one of the largest spots in the united states so i took a couple of therapists with me i brought the salt 
I ran to the engineers for the fifth prototype, literally on the way to the airport to Vegas. I had a backdrop done and I went and debuted the line. I also rented a suite in Vegas, so I had invited 10 of the most esteemed peers in the spa industry. Uh, the head of Nordstrom, the head of Miraval, um, some of the chains, uh, the head of all the Mandarin Orientals, and I knew them. I had sat on boards, I'd co-authored books with them, and I asked them to come get a treatment outside of the conference hours. So there was literally, we could do it at 7 and 9 in the morning, or 8 and 10, or else you got in trouble by the conference. And my first client for the company was all the spa Nordstroms in North America. Oh, wow. That's really good. That, yeah. that was just because you knew that. The woman who's been there 20 yeah, it's kind of like that book outliers, you know, you're only, you know, you're only so far away. If you're in an industry and you're high level, mm -hmm. I think there's another book called In the Meantime, and it deals more with relationships, but I've done more business in the meantime yeah. on a plane, just being off duty at a conference and having a salad or, you know, networking with people or just, I think, you know, like Wayne Dyer says, how do I serve? Yep. You know, if you come with that image to people every day and you kind of don't have what are you going to get back in return, it all pays you forward. So I had known the woman from Nordstrom, but never done business with her. Yep. She'd been at Nordstrom for 26 years. And she said, she goes, I, Ann, I had that massage. She brought her assistant who's been with her for 20 years. And they both flew in from Seattle. Mm -hmm. They uh, had the massages. One had it at 7 p.m. One had it at 8. They had dinner reservations in Vegas and she said I kept feeling my skin and I kept feeling kept thinking I feel so good right now and my skin feels the best it's ever felt is that massage really the difference and she said right then and there I said we're gonna go live with this yeah. and she took a risk but as you know uh, Kevin some of it is about risk yeah. and mitigating kind of worrying about what's gonna happen if this blows up if the concept doesn't work, if this girl, cause she said, Ann, I need to ask some frank questions. How much inventory do you have? Mm -hmm. Can you support a chain like us? Are you insured? You know, some of the things that yeah. could have gotten her in hot water. So I think there's something to being said for having that historical um, commitment with her company. I mean, she was very uh, uh, anchored with mm -hmm. company vision and mission for Nordstrom and kudos for their team because yeah. she asked tough questions. And then for something like that, like did, did you have the inventory? Um, you know, how big of a deal was this for something like you, like since you were just debuting? Yeah. Um, I can tell you, I haven't thought about this in a while, but um, so we went live with 17 Nordstroms right away. Within, well, actually, I went to that conference in October of 14 and I said to everyone, this is a prototype. We finalized it. I've spent five months. This is a good prototype, but we're not going to have it for 14 weeks to mm. sell it. So I didn't have it till March of 2015 to even sell. Well, in March, guess who wanted it? Nordstrom. Okay. So I remember I had to bring in uh, all Himalayan salt is mined in Pakistan. Every little ounce of Himalayan salt. I had met a family through my ex-husband. He had done a, an alumni status program through Harvard. And in July, he graduated. And so I took my kids up because I wanted to let them know wherever they want to go to school is up to them. If it's in the realm mm -hmm. of fairy dust and they can, they can do it and when we were there there was two guys graduating from Pakistan and I just went up to both of them and I said look I'm going to start this Himalayan salt business I know the salt is mined in Pakistan do you know anyone that I could talk to because Peter my ex had been in this program for a year so he had gotten to know these guys and one of them said my brother-in-law sells basmati rice around the world I'll ask him well, I just talked to them. They came from Dubai last week, the family, and they are the largest exporter of Himalayan salt in oh, wow. the world because of me. Not because I buy it all, but because they started developing the trend before it became a trend. So in 2014, you know, there was some salt lamps out there, but not like you can buy them at Costco today. Yeah. And so they said to me, we know you're not our biggest buyer, but you got us in the industry. And now we don't even sell. Himalayan we don't even sell anything but Himalayan salt oh wow Jesus That's yeah crazy. and they are super they're very astute 
well-known yeah. family. Have you, have you in been to Pakistan? Pakistan? They do very well. I haven't, but oh. um, and I've been kind of warned in many respects mm -hmm. just to be very cautious. Yeah. They, of course, say it's fine, and I would have a great time, and maybe at some point I will have that faith in all of it. But yeah. at this point, I may end up taking my kids with me, who are they'll be 14 and 16 at that point to Dubai and meeting the family. Okay. Although I've met them, they've come to the U S I've met them three times and I've met their son who runs the salt. And like mm. they said to me, your family, you got us in this business. Yeah. So I was lucky. Yeah. I got some other big chains. Miraval went on and they're the number one uh, resort destination uh, spawn the U in the world cool. uh, at that time. So all you need is four or five, five star. Mm. And you know, they, like they say, deal with the classes and, or yeah, deal with the classes. Um, you know, it sets you apart, then you can go for all the rest of the spas. They wanna do whatever the five stars are doing. Yeah, so basically like you get to the top ones and everybody else is coming to you because they want the same for their business. Yeah, oh, so great. now we're with like Hand and Stone spas, there's 320 in the US. We're with Lifetime, all the Lifetime Fitness. They have a spa component. Uh, we're with that Woodhouse. They have about 120 spas. Um, there's a couple that are bigger than some of these that I said no to for the right reasons. Mm. You know, just because you're a big franchise doesn't mean, you know, everything's about your cycle of growth. And sometimes franchises get stagnant. They mm -hmm. don't run well. And there's a lot of these membership models that are $39, $49, $59 dollars for a massage now in the U.S., and they're very competitive and some run well and some don't. So some I learned early on is, you know, as a client mm -hmm. or even an employer, I can fire you or you can fire me. Yeah. You know, I mean, with employees, you know, they can fire you too. Yeah. And yeah. if they're worth it, you don't want them to fire you. So yeah. I kind of fired a couple of these chains before they said, yeah. yes, they were like, we're very interested in your line. And I thought that's going to bring my line down, not up. Okay, yeah, so you want to sort of maintain the premium and the quality of where you're, you're, you're at that way. And the integrity. I don't want, you know, someone, you know, not treating what I'm doing with respect because if there are negative claims or some of the therapists don't like it, that's going to weigh on my brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hope your overall brand sort of like the vision that you have for the company. Yeah, yeah, and now I'm being courted by some other wellness uh, franchise opportunities that want to see healing and wellness done in one stop where you would get whatever acupuncture you would get cryotherapy you would get salt you would get uh, chiropractic there may even be a barista there there might be a juice station so they're looking at it's almost like a big fitness component but in a smaller franchise where you could get multiple things for a membership fee because some of the biggest problem in my industry kevin is there's not a lot of massage therapists anymore mm. when the downturn happened so much of it was financial aid to go to massage school and most people couldn't afford 12 15 000. yeah so they didn't go so now we have a huge shortage of massage therapists so we have all these underutilized rooms we you know it's kind of a disruptor really you know they look at the hospitality industry and what Airbnb and yeah. DRO have done to it and disrupted the the whole identity of getting a hotel room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The Airbnb. There's also, I mean, have you ever looked at like those like on demand massage? Type of yeah, Zeal and Soothe. I know uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Zeal, Sammer, very oh, well. Yeah, right. Well, um, pardon me. Oh, I don't know him, but yeah, I've, I've seen those apps as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting model. My thing is, you know, I am making hand-carved stones. Yeah. So, well, I don't have it in front of me, but for the, it, they don't want them carrying a whole bunch. You know, they okay. don't want them. So when you can just come and give a massage, mm -hmm. they even, I think Zeal will buy a client a massage table after so many massages mm -hmm. so that therapist doesn't have to drag it around Dra yep drag yep because i'm I, yeah i was looking into it and i was like oh wow like they're, they're carrying a, the table i'm like oh my god that's crazy yeah. so. and therapists don't like to carry a table so guess what they find jobs where they don't have to carry a table and yeah. zeal wants them to be a massage therapist for a portable massage 
yeah. you know, uh, paradigm and it's a new concept and they've gotten, it's interesting because what they've done is they've changed your model from almost consumers getting massage to now going into resort spas and saying, we can staff your spa mm. with therapists from Seal. So oh. they've looked at a whole different model, which, uh, you know, when I was watching, I had a golf scholarship in college and sorry, this is sometimes what an entrepreneurial mind does. And I can see it in yours where it goes back and forth. Yeah. But I was watching Pebble Beach the other day on the TV, the golf, and I thought, oh my God, they're doing this kind of Akon whole of the something. And what it is, is it's like a fantasy football thing mm -hmm. for golf. And I thought, yeah. man, that is so smart because, you know, golfers, private clubs, their memberships down, people don't like to spend five hours out on a course. Yeah. So the whole industry in reality is in the decline because there's not you know, everyone looks the same now. They're all 24. They all do Pilates. They're not like Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson. Yeah, yeah. So they're having to reestablish kind of yeah. who their market is, what attract people. What to attract people, yeah. Oh, that's, 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 that's interesting. It's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Well, now you know. Now, now you know that I need something to sleep at night because – you know, the fire stays on, doesn't yeah. it? Entrepreneur. It does stay on, especially when you're like someone like you, I could tell like you're so invested into this industry, this whole thing, like you think about it all the time. And it's yeah. sort of, yeah, I know exactly what you're feeling because you're just like, you're reading up on it, on it and you're trying to connect with all the people in the industry. But I look at other industries, uh, a guy I know very well has a boutique car industry and very high end, you know, very, and he said, um, I said, why would you want to put your cars behind glass, mm -hmm. you know, a Ferrari? Because I don't think people will walk in and look at it as reg readily if it was on a dealership lot. And he said to me, because we're burning the dashboards up in Florida, dashboards for a Ferrari can cost 15 grand. And when the sun's beating on the mm -hmm. car and it's outside, but he said, we have this shield. And I said, well, why don't you make that shield for every car then? Like, yeah. instead of just making it for the 60 cars on your, and he's like, I never thought yeah. about that. But like, and my brother's an aerospace engineer and I was never the, uh, yeah. the academia, the family. I mean, I went to business school, but by the right. skin of my chinny chin chin. And my brother went, you know, Embry-Riddle, MIT, aerospace. He runs the only full scale wind tunnel with a rolling road under it in the world. For wow. Penske racing, but what I understood from racing cars with him is it's bolt on, bolt off. I mean, there's almost nothing you can't do if you really think about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So then, okay, interesting. So I constantly look for ways to fix problems. Is yeah. really my goal. You know, I, I always think, wow, the efficiency level here. What if you could do that? Or you know, it's kind of like delivery dudes. Who would have thought five years ago that you know we'd be ordering food from our favorite restaurant paying five bucks to get it delivered to our damn house yeah what? yeah, huh? that, yeah. <laughs> that's such a big big trend now like i own i only order through the apps just... and i have never done that i have never because i'm old school and i want to reward myself with a nice meal out yeah. And, you know, I'm still kind of social where I'm not around enough people yeah. where you probably are like, oh, I'm so tired of talking to people and interviewing people where I'm not. I'm thinking, hell yeah, I'm going to get dressed up and go out. Yeah. No, it's funny because I was actually telling this with like my friends back then where like going out to restaurants, at least for me, going out to restaurants with my family was like a treat. Now, like I go out to eat almost every single day and yeah. it's just like, I just numb to it where before when like we're growing up. It's like, okay, we're going to go eat at a fancy restaurant. It's like, okay, you got dressed up. And that's like, you wear like the normal clothing to a fancy restaurant. Cause it's just like another day. Like they're going to take my money. Yeah. So. Yeah. But you know what? I, unlike today, I like to dress up. I think perception is everything. And I was always worked in five star resorts and it was always certainly my pleasure and all that Ritz Carlton jargon of years ago. And I, I think that people look up, like I have people in my condo project, they're all older, retired, but they'll stop me and say, you're meticulously dressed every day. Yeah. And they want to know what I do. And yeah. that's created, like, even in my condo, I have a guy that wants to invest in my company right now just because he's retired and he's, his accounting firm in Manhattan does 30 million a year and he's bored. 
Yeah, just want to do investing. Okay. And that's because I dress up. Yeah, just by dressing up, yeah. No, yeah, you, got, you always look good, and especially like when we have client meetings here, we always, I always tell my guys, like, you gotta look nice, because you just never know, like maybe we will see the CEO, and we're talking to a marketing manager, but what if the CEO walks by? You wanna look that's good. That's right. So that's right. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so, it's, it's a tradition for me. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, for me, like I have to tell my guys, like you need to dress up because they're so yeah. used to like that whole like tech thing where they see on TV, like no one dresses up. But I'm like, well, my no. daughter wears hoodies, like it's ninety degrees and she has a hoodie on, and I think really it's Florida. But that's just that you know, Vans, surfboard, Billabong. Yeah, it's that, that that's a lifestyle that, that you see all the time. So it's like, oh, it's, it's going to be like. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. So I guess for you, like, I guess most of, for for your customers, you know, ha, have you had any trouble, I guess, retaining customers or like you've, the people that you brought on board or have used your product, they've never really left you? Is that sort of, a, has that been an issue or anything like that? No, they haven't left. What they'll complain about or I'll yeah. be challenged with is, the price point, we're US engineered. I don't buy 10,000 at a time. It's not made in China. Mm -hmm. And the, I think that's challenging. So I'm coming up now with a kind of a low end model because I believe that book, The Paradox of Choice, mm -hmm. where if you give someone one choice, they'll say yes or no. But if you give them a choice of three, they're gonna pick one. Yeah. And so I've just come up last year, I, two years ago, I came up with a second model that was lower priced. And this year I'll be coming up with one that will be for the individual sole practitioner to use in a rented or leased kind of therapeutic massage situation or chiropractic more for the, just the one or two therapists that work on their own, that kind of thing that will be at a $300 price point. Because really I've had a lot of chains say, mm -hmm. Oh, we need you to sign exclusivity agreements. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I did this is because Himalayan salt is good for you. You yeah. rub it on the skin and it's mineral rich and alkaline and exfoliating. Why in the hell would I want to sign an exclusivity yeah. and try not to get it into every consumer's hands? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that makes sense. Cause they just want it for themselves. And then for something like these solar practitioners, like, you know, the $300 product, how do you plan on like att attracting these type of practitioners or, or customer consumers essentially? Well, uh, everyone's waiting for it. So mm -hmm. I just need to say, hey, here's the Bentley model. This is why you'd want it in your five-star treatment room. It's LED lit, it's beautiful, it's this, it's that. And here's the starter unit. And maybe you want to start with the starter unit and go up to the Bentley, but this gets it in the treatment room. And then you get to see how quickly the return on investment is, how your clients start retaining you more and more for therapeutic massage. And it's a win-win. So, you know, it's kind of a, a bet on even trying the lower end model, which has the same benefits. It's just the delivery of heat will be mm. not as pretty or pristine or prestigious or high end looking. So um, we don't we don't lose clients. They'll say, you know, I'm just not in the position to spend X amount on. Yeah. We have 15 treatment rooms, and I need to put this in each treatment room, and it's too expensive. So um, yeah, I mean. Honestly, Kevin, it's not about the clients. It's about me freeing up my time so I can creatively think. Because yeah. when I don't creatively think, I don't think of new items and new things to do. Yeah. Okay. And do they do clients ever come to you with like, oh, I want this type of stone or this type of setup, and then you're like, oh, let me think about that, and then you yes, like, yeah, okay. We're doing that a lot more. We did the largest uh, salt room Haman in uh, the Caribbean in Jamaica, in Montego Bay. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing looking. Um, I have another web, another company called Himalayan Source. So if you went on that, you'd see it. Um, so what happened there is now the owner of all the sandals properties, there's 21 sandals in the Caribbean. He saw it because he lives in Montego Bay. So now he's using all of the saltability line. And we're about to put in a couple of of uh, salt rooms in two of his one is a rebuild and one is a new design I think in St. Lucia so what mm -hmm. it's doing is it's opening people's perspectives to say not really can you design this but um, do you have the capacity and I think for you and I and other entrepreneurs it's staying true to 
always answering those questions and always being available, not spreading yourself too thin. You know, why did I start this? I started it to solve a problem and to keep this therapeutic way and low energy and saving water to the masses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that means we're in Hong Kong, we're in Macau, we're in England, we're in Ireland, we're in Australia. I need to keep growing my distributorship. But every time I try and grow a distributor, man, it takes me away from my day job because it's a lot of work to work, establish. Work, yeah. When you do these type of projects, let's say the one in like Montego, do you ever do you yourself ever go there uh, to do the installations or? Yeah. Okay, nice. That's good. Yeah, I do. And a lot of times they want me to because last year at uh, the Four Seasons Oahu, it was a beautiful property and they had a salt wall Mm -hmm. built it was two years ago before I had de designed the company and I said I'm just not ready to build it go with this other guy and they mm -hmm. did and I don't know what went wrong but something didn't go exactly right so they called me and they said hey can you help us finish this so I did and then they were like we don't know what to do with this room yeah. so then I designed the treatment and they won a huge innovation award for it oh, wow so a lot of times I'm the one I'm licensed in all areas of spas, an esthetician, yeah. a massage therapist, all that. So then I can kind of connect the dots and design treatments. And that's what I did in Montego Bay. And that's, they just had the housewives of Orange County go there last <laughs> month. And you know, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, mentioned in their uh, TV show. Yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> Perfect. And then I guess like another question I have for you is sort of, you know, I know you started using your engineers. Do you ever like, do, do you still use those engineers? Are they still part of your team or is it sort of like, kind of like a one-off type of thing? How, how does that sort of work? The ones that help you design and develop? Well, uh, so honestly, and I am 100% honest, um, we had a problem with our first generation unit. It would, you know, some of the lights would go out of the LED system. So it would still heat, but it wouldn't light. And that was a problem with the engineering of it. But luckily it made it through its one year warranty and I was all good, but people yeah. aren't really happy, you know, yeah. if, if it goes out in 14 months or 19 months. So I looked at three other engineering companies mm -hmm. about three years ago and went with the second generation and we've had no problems, okay. which is good and bad because if it has a one year warranty, there's a lot of people that would say to you, Hey, make sure that it doesn't last too long so you can sell it to people yeah. again. But I'm not really born of that cloth. Yeah. I'd rather it last as long as and they get happy, good feelings about dealing with me or saltability. So yeah, I still use engineering companies. I've gotten smarter about having them additionally insured and making mm -hmm. sure they're the manufacturer and some of that stuff because anytime you're dealing with electric, yeah. you, know, you need to be real mindful that, of yeah. the uh, potential to you know, uh, be challenged in your own business or harm anyone. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, any other sort of electronic stuff, because like, we know with some clients too, it's just like you need to be insured, or even if you're importing, just making sure you have all the right paperwork. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I guess another question is like, how did you, for someone an entrepreneur like yourself, that how did you find the sort of engineering companies? Did you go online? Did you have friends? Sort of like, how would someone start that if they they don't have this sort of experience? Um, but, you know, it's just I think if you're curious, and I think. I think that's a sign of intelligence. I've always been curious what, I mean, you name it. If I meet a person, I don't know why, but I, if they're, you know, if they're worth it and they seem smart enough, I want to know about them. So same with, if I'm looking for something, I'll just go and start, you know, we have Google now and yeah. World Wide Web where we didn't before. I mean, I grew up with a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas. I mean, it was very limiting to not plagiarize on yes what a parakeet eats or whatever because you everyone used the same book um now there's so much that it really i hate to say it but it really dumbs it down to find a million people that can help you yeah. at your fingertip and my kids i i hope that they're uh realize how what a luxury it is yeah. to have you know a computer called your phone you know mm -hmm. with you at all times um you know, so it's not hard. I think the curiosity in me always drills down things to get me exactly where I need to be. No, exactly. That's sort of exactly how I feel too. Like from us here, or at least for me, whenever I need to find something, I just Google it or YouTube 
YouTube, we literally find anything and how to make something. Or if you see someone talking about it, just email. So I always email people. Well, and that's how I learned tennis. Like I had a golf scholarship in college and I wanted to play tennis. And my instructor was pretty good. I didn't want to fire her, but yeah. I also knew she wasn't that good. So I'd just sit and watch the forehand and the backhand yeah. on YouTube. And she'd say, gosh, you've gotten a lot better in the, since the last lesson. I think it's not because of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, trust me. I always tell I always tell people like whenever we do marketing stuff here, it's like, oh, this is a cool new tactic or trick. I'm like, oh, I know. I just saw it on YouTube. It was just looking up new tactics for 2019. And honestly, what people are doing. People are and we put out a lot of YouTube. We probably have 18, 20 videos because this is such a new concept that I would get very, very uh, challenged with telling people. Yeah the same thing over and over how to clean the stones how to set up the kit so i just had a little a college guy that was getting his master's in video work come in and we put the backdrop up and i did about 15 videos but you know i was prepared i had done an atlanta tv show on wellness every week yep. so i'd gotten good at being in front of the camera you know i mean how much can you screw up you yeah. know you know we're our own worst enemy we get in our own way if we allow ourselves yeah. so I, a lot of times will just push through and say, Hey, these people want to know how to set it up. I need to do this in two minutes. And, uh, so yeah, we have a lot of video content and that way any of my support staff can just say, Oh, you want to know how to clean the stones? Here's a video. And then they look at it and they go, wow, this is high level. And yeah, I think, yeah. No, exactly. Even, even with the videos and recording or just like even what I'm doing now, like I used to always just get in my head, like, Oh my God, I'm not going to know what to say. And I'm just like, I need to do it. And, you know, it turns out fine and just push through it and you just get better and then you get more confident and I mean I just love talking to people like yourself it's just interesting stories and I'm learning and yeah like you said just like you get you get in your own head sometimes yeah 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 I I think um it's, 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 like, it's like that entrepreneurial curse which is like you kind of try to be a perfectionist and uh it's just like everything in your head just comes out together at once well, the funny thing is, is uh, it was actually through a little bit of couples therapy about 10 years ago um, that my ex-husband and I went through, um, where the woman, she was a very good therapist from Northwestern, and she said, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I just like to talk about your perfectionistic um, you know, qualities, and I was like, what perfectionistic qualities? I'll never forget it. I mean, I was like, what are you talking about? And so she went through it, and I was like, Oh my God, she is talking about me. Like I had no idea. Yeah. And I think I'm all that in a bag of chips about perception and reading people and all that. And she just started drilling down this checklist of stuff. And I was thinking, no, that sounds like me. No, no. Hmm. Wow. Maybe I am. But I think age and being aware, you know, yeah. we say I'm Catholic and we say in Catholicism, contrition is when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying to be less about Catholic guilt, and more just about if I know better, I'm going to do better. Yeah. And I yeah. think, uh, you know, the same is if I'm a perfectionist, I'm going to, it's going to be, like I said, my best and worst quality. Yeah. So I need to use it to my benefit. And I think some of that as I age is I'm learning not to judge other people. And in turn, it helps me not judge myself. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, because like you don't. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you never really know what someone's going through or what they're doing or how they've done things, and that's something I've gotten better as I, I guess I've gotten older. It's like you realize that like, oh wow, like I had this really bad day today, and but no one knows it, and so it's like sometimes like I'm thinking about like, hey, like what if they're also going through something that I don't know? Because like sometimes I just think about myself, I'm like oh wow, like today's not really good, but no one really knows why because I'm not telling people. So I try not to like, that's why I think I'm like, Oh, I don't, I wouldn't want someone to judge me based on that. Well, and everyone has pain in their life, whether like there was a book I read that said, we all have a worry box. And when you get rid of a big worry and you've gotten rid of one where you think, Oh, oh yeah. but then you fill it right back up. Yeah. I mean, literally within moments you're like, Oh, my worry box is so full again. And, and I think, yeah, first of all, I don't know the pain people are going through. And what I do is if someone does trouble me, I usually say a quick prayer and I say, God, please help them. I think that they may have be, you know, spiritually or emotionally ill in some way right now. Mm -hmm. And I hope God will benefit them. And, you know, it just kind of sets me free from saying, well, 
how they had road rage and I'm gonna yeah. cuss in the car or who cares? Yeah, you know, yeah. um and some of this is a bigger learning curve than others. I mean, me being, you know, single as a 50 year old, you know, is a little different. I mean, yeah. I'm not that well versed as into driving in my own lane and not being road rage about yeah single is new for me so it's you know a different level of newness and it comes with learning curves yeah learning curves something new uh, perfect um i so have two final questions so last question is sort of um you know what's like a good advice for like a brand new entrepreneur starting out or someone that just kind of wants to do something but they don't know you know how to get started or you know what to do what, what would be the advice that you would give someone i would write a business plan don't mm -hmm. make it you know it can be very simple and then make sure that what you're offering, you feel it has a unique selling proposition. You know, I interviewed a lot of girls and they'll say, oh, I'm going to start a makeup line. Yeah. Well, there's quite a few of those. Yeah. Not that yours can't be the best, but I mean, you know, there's private label companies that will, you know, Make take their cool. makeup nine for, you know, the Kardashians and everyone else and put their label on it. So, you know, make sure that it's got some uniqueness, and that you have some funding for it, whatever that is, um, and that you're ready to do this, mm -hmm. that you're not like, gosh, I'm super in debt, I this, I have this and this. Make sure that it's gonna work to those levels that you can have an accountability for a business plan. Okay, perfect, but yeah, sounds good. Yeah, no, exactly, like you need to be ready to start your own business and uh, just kind of, Cause it's going to take a lot of work. I always tell people the same thing too. Like it's going to take a lot of work and kind of try to find something you love doing because there's going to be days that you don't want to do anything, but that passion and just like that goal that you have, that this is what you want to do is going to keep you going. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell yeah you and you gotta that. know yeah. my 2019 motto and sorry for all you entrepreneurs that are like, well, this was really good until she, you know, you got to know when to hold them and fold them like Kenny yeah. Rogers song. You know, when they show out Einstein had 15 failures or didn't make it through high school or whatever, you know, all these people that failed. It's true. Failure is a part of life. Yeah. Um, but I also think that, you know, you having a good gut instinct about it, too, and saying, hey, I'm going to take a sharp right turn now because I just failed here, but I can see I can pick up the ball and run downfield. But if you're kind of like, this is a loser and I, I just need to tell people this isn't working, tell people because they're going to love you either way. This is, you know, most of your friends and family are going to respect that you tried. Yep. But coming from one perfectionist to another, most of us don't want to really say, oh, I failed, but I tried. Yeah, most people don't want that. I think that failure is what scares people the most from trying something new or doing a business. I always tell people like, I've failed hundreds of times. And like, just kind of keep going. Like I just yeah. love the, the challenge and he was like, Oh, you're, you got so lucky. I'm like, Oh, I've, I've done it a hundred of times since college. I've been doing things and just trying and experimenting and just learning. Well, and it's like hang gliding. If we went hang, you know, gliding, we'd both be scared to death. Yep. But if we did it for the 19th time, we'd be like, Oh, it's no big deal. So yep. sometimes just putting yourself out there to be vulnerable, you know, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability and how uncomfortable it is, but you kind of get used to the uncomfortable. And what I say to people now is this is my new life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's full of new trails and I can be resistant to them, but they're coming either way. And I want to go down them. Yeah. You want, yeah. It's, it's also being your, you want them to happen to you too. So it's like, you're accepting that things might not be okay and that's fine because you're open to that and you want to see how do you how do you change how do you, does it affect you and sort of how do you overcome that At least that's and what's the gratitude what's the nuggets in those three you know in the thing you did like what do you take away from it that you can say this was a positive instead of boy i stubbed my toe really hard yeah perfect okay and then i guess the final question is sort of where can we go to learn more about yourself about your business, like your business? It's your all on saltability.com. Really, like I said, there's so much information on there. And um, I don't know that I'd say to anyone, go online and look about Ann Brown. I'd say, you know, what was the one thing that Kevin and Ann said together that's going to be the catalyst for you to say, gosh darn it, you know, not only do I like myself, but I can do this. Yeah. And even if you do it in baby steps, it's little habits to create changes and patterns in your life. And, you know, I'm encouraged. I'm not perfect. I'm not. And um, 
I'm encouraged by people all the time, whether it's a bad story or a good story, to think, hey, you know, um, so it wouldn't be about looking at Ann Brown at saltability. It would just be more about where you are your, in your cycle of growth as an entrepreneur and where do you think the next step, the right step is for you right now at your growth of you as a person or you and your company. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ann. It was great, great talking to you. Yeah. You bet. Thank